Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. If you are true to yourself, your own self will show in your art. Welcome once again to the Pencil Kings podcast. I am excited today to talk to Renee Chio. I'll let her say her name with the, the proper pronunciation because I'm not great at rolling my R's. Um, but uh, we were talking, the team was talking about Renee's work earlier today. And so I've been um, going through and, and looking at a lot of her work. It's very exciting for me. I feel personally inspired to try some of the things that I've seen her document in some of the the step by step tutorials that she's put out. I think that it's, it's really um, she has a really amazing, or you have a, a really amazing grasp of um, skin tones, especially that I, I just am fascinated by uh, these days. I've been getting into more digital painting. So welcome, Renee. Um, could you give people a one minute overview to start off about who you are and what you do, and then we'll get into some of the questions. Sure. Um, well, hello everyone. My name is Rene. Um, well, the correct presentation would be Rene. Um, there we go. <laughs> um, I'm an animator. I went to study in Canada for two years in 2006, 2007, I mean. And I was there for two years to study classical animation and 3D animation, animation in Vancouver. And well, the decision to become an animator started when I was in high school, when I uh, was introduced to digital art. And uh, I started painting in forums. There were some forums called Oikaki, which are like uh, online platforms to paint. And you post your drawings and you meet people and everything. And then I moved to Photoshop and then Flash. And when I started doing animations in Flash, like my life changed forever. Like this was what I was meant to do. And that's why I went to animation school <clears throat> in Canada, because in Mexico, there wasn't such a thing as an animation school. So I had to do it overseas. So I found this school in, in Vancouver called Van Arts, and I was there for a year for classical animation. And then I moved on to Think Tank Training Center in North Vancouver, and I studied 3D animation. But I always knew that 2D animation was my thing. So when I came back to Mexico, I got a job at Anime Studios and I started working for TV shows and feature film and all made in, in Flash. And when I was there working, I started doing some digital painting. Like I had started, I had started um, doing some digital, digital drawing thing like, um, and in high school. And when I was working at the studio, I wanted to try the digital painting technique and I liked it a lot so I just kept doing it and it became my new hobby and I liked it just as much as I liked animation so it became like not my profession but I can now live off you know painting and animating and yeah that's pretty much what I'm doing right now like uh, I, I still do some freelance animation for short films and live shows, commercials, whatever, and I'm on my way to publishing my first art book. So it's like uh, doing my two favorite things, and I'm super nice. accomplished. And Renee, how old are you? I, I'm just curious. I am 28. I just turned 28. 28. Yeah. Okay. So I have so many questions because I think what you did is amazing. Um, just the fact that I've met some people before and I had a similar experience where I wanted to study in San Francisco. But when I looked at what the tuition was going to be, uh, I believe it was something around $40,000 US a year as an international student. Um, I, I, as soon as I saw the price, I just said no. Like I, I, I just immediately, as soon as I saw that, uh, the dream was dead. Um, but you went ahead and did it. And I'm curious about, well, obviously there was no schools that you could find, but I, I feel like at that time there must have been online resources in 
2007 or so that you could have used, but um, you you went to a, a different country, which I really encourage people to go and travel and, and see different cultures and see what life is like in different places. And there's all kinds of other benefits. But um, why, why did you choose to do that instead of doing the, the sort of like self-study or, or ordering books or, or things like that? Well, I was fortunate enough to have uh, my dad supporting me. Um, that was pretty much the the main reason I, I could do it at the time. Because when I was looking for an animation school here, like it just seemed impossible. Like it wasn't happening here. Nobody knew about animation back then and animation schools were just like uh, very small and the courses were like two months long. Cause I had a friend who was studying at these little animations and it was just like not what I wanted really. I wanted like the real thing, you know, even though I had no mm-hmm. idea what the real thing was, I just knew that it didn't exist here yet. And so I told my dad about it and he was always super supportive. Like, in Mexico, people tend to have this uh, super uh, close-minded, uh, they're super close-minded about uh, getting a degree and everything. Like They're like, if you don't have a degree, you're pretty, mu- pretty much nobody out there. And fan arts only gives you a diploma, you know, and most people here would be like, no, if you do if you do that, you will have to uh, get an actual degree eventually. So my dad was like, you know, just do whatever you want. You manage. So he supported me throughout that year. And the tuition in fan arts was actually pretty low compared to other schools. That's why I went to Van Arts. Because before I decided to go there, I was looking into some animation schools in, in the States. And I found uh, the Savannah College of Art and Design. And that one was like super expensive. And mm-hmm. there was no way I was going to afford it. Like, because my, my English and everything was not very good. So I had to do at least uh, six months of English and then you know, saving money for uh, tuition and living there. Uh, and and Van Arts was just like 18000 Canadian dollars at a time. It was much, much cheaper than mm-hmm. any other school. Because even in Vancouver, there were other schools like VFS. And the price is like, uh, uh, there, there's a big difference in the price there. Uh, so Van Arts was like a perfect school. Like it was small and the building was falling apart. So it felt like super cozy, you know, like it was an old high tech like it is right now, but it was just small and cozy. And the people, the, the, the groups were very small and the people were very warm. So I don't know. I really loved it there. So even though it was cheap and small and everything, I, I got everything I was expecting and even more like from an animation school. That's awesome. And I have a really good friend who's teaching there now, and I think the, the program that he was telling me about is, is really good at Van Arts. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious. So you went and you did two years of schooling, and then you came back home. And were you then like a rock star animator when you came back home because you had studied abroad? Or uh, did you find it was difficult to find a job And um, when once you did find a job that you were one of the lower people? Um. When I came back, uh, I found a job like two weeks uh, after my arrival, uh, per- pretty much because uh, the the studio needed a new animator, and there weren't that many animators in Mexico. And so I had a friend working there already, and so she recommended me. There, were, she was like, "I have this friend who just came back from Canada, and she's looking for a job." So they. They called me in and I did an animation test and they hired me. Uh, so I think it was easy for me because they needed animators. Like right now, there are many more animators here because uh, VFS is offering uh, scholarships constantly and because there are um, animation schools here now. Uh, so I, I think it's getting more difficult to get a job as an animator. So I was fortunate enough to start on animation like when nobody was doing it so right now I have like um, I don't know seven years of experience or something like that Uh, 
So whenever a studio or a project needs an animator, um, like people know me already. Like, hey, the, there's this animator I know, and she's worked for this and this and this other project. So it's not very hard for me to get animation jobs right now. It's pretty cool because of that, because I got in the animation industry at the right time. Yeah. What, what do you think you would give as advice for people who are in Mexico or, or in a similar situation right now where they feel that they're not so sure about the, the local or the quality of the local programs? Would you say go for it? Like find if, if it looks expensive, like find a way to make it happen. Um, just make sure you do your homework because there are bad schools in Canada. There are bad schools in the U.S. all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, but would you be really encouraging for people to do that or would you say – more that, well, these days it's a little bit different that there is a lot of resources online and you, you could take a year to study on your own and see how far you can get. Or do you think it, there's nothing that really compares to the school? I think uh, for animation, I really encourage people to go to an actual animation school. Like, I, I don't know how, uh, how it would work if you were self-taught in animation. Because I did it in painting, like, uh, I'm a self-taught artist, but as for animation, I have no idea how that would work. Like, there are millions of resources out there. Like, you have, like, uh, digital tutors and other, like, uh, YouTube tutorials. And I'm pretty sure there are online courses. I think uh, San Francisco Academy has a few online programs on animation. So whenever... uh, Mexican studio and asked me what I would recommend to become a good animator because most of the time they're super disappointed of, on their programs because they are like four years long and they don't really learn animation because the people teaching there aren't animators, you know, they are like people with degrees and uh, master degrees and they really don't have the experience to teach like the real deal. So they come to me and they're like, I'm super disappointed of this program and I'm bored out of my mind and I think I'm starting to hate animation. And I'm like, <laughs> don't, just drop out, you know? Like if you're starting to hate animation, chances are it's not the animation, it's the school. Because I love animation. Like the way I was taught animation is, I, I don't know, it made me super happy, super motivated and super passionate about it. Like my animation teacher was like the best person ever. And he would always encourage you to uh, become a better animator, a better actor. And he made you passionate about it. Like there was no way you could hate animation after taking a class with them. So whenever I am asked about it here, I, I tell them to to look for an, a school in another country, like the States or Canada, I don't know, France. And they they usually come from expensive schools, you know, like it's not like they don't have the resources to pay for it. And most of the time, what keeps them from leaving the country and looking for an animation school is the fact that their parents want them to get a degree. Like it's always the same story. They're like, but my dad wants me to get a degree because otherwise I'm nothing out there. I'm like, you know what? The industry doesn't even care if you didn't go to high school. Like as, as long as your portfolio and your demo reel speaks for you, that's what matters. And and if you, you can pay for this school, like if your parents can pay for this school, they can totally pay for a year in Canada. Like just uh, save all that money from those four years you're going to waste in this school and just uh, invest them in the, in the school in, in, in Canada. Like... Uh, right now, the Canadian dollars are a bit uh, cheaper for us. So, and, and I think Canada is uh, friendlier when it comes to foreign students. So I, I think it's always the, the best option. And, and you have like uh, VFS and Sheridan, and which are like awesome schools. Yeah, I think that's really, I've never thought of it that way, that if you're looking at going into a four-year program, really consider how how much time you're actually 
quote unquote wasting mm -hmm. because I feel that in a year and we've interviewed several people now that in one year you can make amazing, amazing progress with whatever kind of art you want to do as long as you work your butt off. Like some people do it at home, some people go to school, um, but it definitely doesn't, does not take four years to go from even a, a beginner to somebody who's employable. Mm -hmm. It's totally doable in one year when you really work hard. The people that don't see the results are those that think that, oh, you know, it's something that I kind of dabble at. It's more like I feel like when you are working as a as an artist, the the quality level is so high. Like you can't fake being a bad artist. You can fake being a bad a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, but art, you show your art and someone says, that's just bad. You yeah. can't, you can't really hide, you know? And, but as long as you're willing to put in the work, it happens. And, and when you're living as an artist, it's like, it's not really something that you turn on or off. Like even when you're out at a coffee shop, you're looking at things, you're like, wow, that graffiti I saw on the way to the coffee shop was just amazing. I took a photo of it here, check it out. Mm -hmm. And you're always like looking at things, evaluating and improving. And, and, um, so yeah, four years versus one year, I would definitely encourage people to go for the one year, um, route and, and really ask, if you're thinking about a four year or even a three year, like what, what are you really going to get out of three years that you couldn't do in one year or maybe 18 months? Yeah, exactly. Like when I went to Vancouver and both programs, like the classical animation program, and the 3d animation program, like both have just what I needed to be a good animator, good artist in the industry. You know, like they didn't teach me anything that wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't be useful once I became an animator. So I was taught like storyboard, uh, animation, uh, character design, layout, um, uh, live drawing, um, and 3D. I, I learned uh, a bit of rigging, modeling, uh, compositing. You know, like those are things that are useful once you are in the industry. And yep. the, the, the thing about animation schools is that you get to to try all of that, like the, the whole pipeline. So when you come out of animation school, you can either choose to be a storyboard artist or a character designer. You know, it's not just about animation. It's just about the whole pipeline. As if, as if you could just start your own animation studio right after school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I I went down that road, made a studio one one time, and it it was a it was a whole different beast running a business versus doing the artwork. Yeah, um, totally. Which actually is a good way that we can transition this conversation because I'm curious about um, you know before we start recording, you're telling me that you're full time freelance now, mm -hmm. and lately we've been talking to a lot of freelance artists, and I know it's something that a lot of people uh, want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so many different ways that you could become a freelance artist. Um, and I'm curious how you made the transition from working at an animation studio to going full-time freelance. Did you just one day stop everything and say, no, I'm full-time freelance? Or were you moonlighting, you know, at, at night you were doing some freelance contracts and then it, you, eventually so many people were asking for freelance work that you said, oh, I can just do this full-time or how, how did it work out for you? Um, when I was still working at the studio, I started doing my digital painting stuff. So uh, it was in 2012 when I decided to become like a real digital painting artist. So I, I started uh, posting my art on Facebook. Like I had already been drawing and posting things on DeviantArt and other like, platforms. But it wasn't, I wasn't popular at all. Like nobody knew anything about me. And once I started doing a different type of art, uh, people started liking it. So I, I started getting a bunch of followers. Like it was super weird because I, I would get like um, 14 likes in a, a picture on Facebook and I felt like, oh my God, I'm super popular. And from 2012, everything changed. I started getting a lot of followers and likes on my paintings and everything. And everybody started knowing me in Mexico. Like I was a very local artist. So I, that helped me a lot to become more known, not only as an artist, artist but as an animator too. Because 
they would be like, hey, Renee also happens to be an animator, you know, and a lot of projects would need animators and everything. So they would call me in for a, a project. And as for digital painting, they would ask me for uh, workshops and talks and everything. So uh, I started like giving talks and workshops uh, around the country. And that was while I was still working at the, at the studio. So once I decided to leave the studio, I was already locally known. And I, I could get jobs uh, easily, you know, but not easily, but easier, as if I had been just a nobody. Uh, I think that would have been much harder, like a lot of, uh, a lot of work uh, sending out uh, demo reels to studios and everything. And, and most, of, most studios here don't look for freelance artists. They want you to work inside. So uh, I would um, just put my demo reel out there, you know, like just the way I posted my art. And people would be like, hey, this is, here's an animator in case I need one one day. And yeah, that happened. Like uh, people would start started calling me. Um, because they, they needed freelance animators. So um, I, I started doing freelance animation that way. And as for digital painting, I would take commissions, uh, mostly just uh, uh, workshops. So I, I'm curious because there's there's a lot of advice out there that says um, if you want to be an artist, um, step one, be awesome. Step two, post to Facebook. And I'm I'm not really a huge fan of that advice because I find that there's a lot of people who um, they're not awesome. And and you you are awesome. Like your work is amazing. I feel like this conversation, uh, the way that we've been talking, makes it sound like you're just this new student. But it's, that's not it at all. I just was curious about the the going from another country. Um, Renee's work is amazing, mm-hmm. and uh, I encourage you to. We'll we'll get the links for that at the end of the show. But um, I really like the the style that you have for the characters. Um, that it's there's like a a very delicate balance of realism and style. And I feel like the style comes through in the face and the hair, but then the rest of the body is very realistic. And the the way that you do shading on the skin is amazing. So you, you, I guess did that, but what happened in 2012 that you said when you were started posting on Facebook, you weren't getting a lot of action Mm -hmm. and then something happened in 2012 and you were getting a lot. Did, did, what, what was it? Um, I don't know, like, uh, everything I drew before that was mostly uh, fan art, um, uh, photo studies, like, nothing that really felt me, you know. Like, I, I think art is about being you in your art, and that makes it more authentic. And in 2012 is when I found myself an artist, as an artist. I started, like, painting for myself, not for likes or not to make people like me. Because, you know, when you make fan art, it's easy for people to like you, you know, because you're painting their favorite characters because you're a gamer or whatever. But when you do your own stuff, when you do do original art, it's a little bit harder to be someone. Um, I I think you need to be very... um, aware of who you are and what you like and not care about anything else. And I think once you do that, it shows in your own art. Like it starts becoming uh, unique. It starts becoming um, the individual who paints that, you know, and I, that happened to me. You know, there was something that just clicked. like I started feeling like I could paint for myself and not for everyone else. And at, at first, I don't know, maybe it was uh, hard for people to to accept it, but then they were like, you know, I can see a person here. And right now people are like, oh, your style is super easy to uh, to identify. You know, like they can tell by the eyes or the, 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 the proportions, whatever. And it's something I'm not aware of. I just do it because I like it, it makes me happy. 
And whenever I feel like painting something, I do it because I was inspired by something and not just like doing photo studies or anything. Like I, I've seen lately like that getting you that making photo studies makes you super popular. But that's not the the order. That's just a photo study. And I like to be known as a as my own person. So I don't know, I think I just started getting known for being Rene Chio and not just the girl that makes fan art. And I think that was my goal as an artist. I love that you just said that and it makes so much sense. And I, I feel like it's something that if someone had told me that advice, maybe even like three years ago, I might not have understood it. Uh, this idea of fan art versus your own art or trying to paint like someone mm-hmm. um, versus painting for yourself. And recently we talked to, with uh, Derek Rodenbeck and he said that when things started to explode for him is when he stopped trying to do things for likes or trying to trying to do things for like outward gratification and he started doing things for inward gratification and then amazing things started to happen. Yeah. But I think it's a little bit scary because <clears> – <throat> It's kind of vulnerable, or it seems vulnerable, uh, when you post your art and, and uh, people. You don't know what people are going to react. You know that you like it and that you you made it for yourself. You didn't really make it for anybody else. And you post it, and uh, maybe they like it, maybe they don't. You don't know, but it's like you're bearing your soul a little bit. Did you feel like that when you made this choice? Yeah, totally. You know, I, because it's like people are seeing the real you. You know, when you are uh, on the internet, like on Facebook, on Twitter, whatever. You kind of create your own online online persona. You are a different person online than you are in person, uh, especially with introverts. I don't know. Like uh, I feel like I can express myself more through uh, written words than spoken words. So it's easy for me to be more um, outspoken on the internet. But when it comes to my art, I feel like it. It's myself. Like, doesn't matter what I say on Facebook or on Twitter. My art will always tell the truth, you know, because I do it for myself, because I do it to express my feelings. And I think that's why I do this kind of art. I just like to express what I feel through it. Because there are some things that I just cannot just say with words. And they're like, you know what? I just, I'll just say it with a picture. So I create this, uh, these characters that represents something that I truly feel. And it is very scary. It makes you super vulnerable because you're like telling people how you really feel. And I don't know, I, I, when someone uh, says, for example, a, a negative comment about it, you just feel like hiding forever. Like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for being myself. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's it's weird, especially with my close friends and family. Like, when strangers see my art, it's okay. They don't know me, you know. They just assume who I am by my art. And But with my close friends and family, I don't know what they think. You know, like, oh, Rene is a completely different person. Like, she, she's definitely not expressing... Uh, well, she, she, she is not being who she usually is with us through her art. Because um, I think when you express your feelings through art, um, I don't know, it just uh, it seems so pure, you know. So I, I think my, my friends and family have a certain uh, idea of who I am, but my art tells them a completely different version of me, a version that I don't show them. I don't know, I like it. (laughs) So I'm curious what your opinion is 
um, because I was looking through your Deviant Art gallery, and I love going back when people have a long history on Deviant Art, and you can see the progression that they made. And you can definitely see there's almost like a break point. Mm -hmm. I feel like, and I, I would guess now that if I went and looked at the dates, that it's probably around that 2012 point. But what advice would you give to somebody who, you know, they've been doing fan art or they've been trying to paint like you or they've been trying to paint, I, I'm just going to throw out a couple names that come to mind or Camilla or uh, Loish. And uh, we just talked about how that's not really the way that you have to be you, right? Like you could take inspiration from other people. You could do studies of other people. But at, at the end of the day, the thing, the good things are going to happen is when you find your voice and that's when you allow yourself to be vulnerable and show your own work. But then there's also um, the discussion about skills versus art. So there's – we've talked with a lot of people and how, what they feel is that they need to be, be able to draw something perfect from their imagination before they can do their own art. And some of these people have very high levels – I would consider very high levels of skill. Some of them have lower levels of skill. But where, where along that journey of developing your skills do you think – it's a good place to start branching out and allowing your own voice to show through to the world where you, you consciously stop doing fan art or maybe you do less fan art and you allow your own creations to, uh, to be shown to other people so that they can comment on them and, and just start to show your true self to people. Where, you know, if you're just starting out, can you, can you go there or do you have to do a lot of in-depth studies and be able to render photorealistically uh, before you, you should allow yourself to, to let your voice be, her, be, I guess, be seen mm -hmm. by other people? Mm, in my case, I started painting, like, uh, painting my, my own stuff. Um, I had been doing a lot of fan art and everything, but I, I wasn't really copying any artists. And I, I was just doing, you know, fan art with my with the style I had developed which was like super crappy anime style and once I, I wanted to do my own stuff I didn't really bother too much with anatomy or uh, being too precise with light and or color or anything I just kind of did it you know uh, I would observe a lot of artists and photographs I, I get a lot of inspiration from photographs that's why I like uh, to do lighting like super precise and very photographic I don't know but I, I, I guess at some point I, I thought it was very important to become really good at anatomy and color and everything technical so I started doing like photo studies and trying to be super fast you know because there are some artists who can make amazing speed paintings in 30 minutes or less and I was just focusing on that I thought I had to be like them. I had I thought there was a certain process I had to follow in order to become a good artist. So I was like, okay, I need like 20 minutes of spray painting and then I'll move on to three hours of anatomy and, you know, like a very strict routine. And I realized I wasn't enjoying it. Learning all of that, yes, it, it's useful. You need it in order to achieve certain styles. You know, if you're going for something super stylized, cartoony style, maybe you don't need to be very, very precise with anatomy. But if you want something more like uh, Legend of the Crypt type of art, of course, you will need a lot of knowledge on anatomy and, and color and light and composition and all of that stuff. So I, I, I stopped having this routine. I, it, I started... Once I was, I was already doing my own work, you know, it's not like I, I, I started doing all of this before. Like, it, it, I had already done a few years of art. And when I was uh, doing this strict routine, I wasn't enjoying it because it, it seemed like more like something I had to do and not something that I wanted to do. And I, I stopped doing that. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I'll just I'll just paint. I'm not going to focus on how good or bad the anatomy is for now. Because I, I know that I will get better if I keep painting. Like it, It's the same thing if you paint uh, for five hours. If you, well, if you practice five hours of anatomy every day, then if you do your own paintings five hours that day, you know, like in, instead of just painting random figures, you, 
you draw those figures in your paintings. And so I started doing that, like learning as I am painting, not just uh, doing studies and everything. And I like to, to sketch on the street a lot. So that helped me a lot with my observation skills and everything. Like I've always told people that learning is not just about having a book with you or a sketchbook or it's something to work on. Like you can just learn by just observing. Like that's the way I have learned a lot of things. For example, lighting. I, I'm always observing lighting. As I am talking right now with you, I'm just observing how the light is hitting my room, you know. It, it, it's something that you cannot just uh, stop doing. You, if you, your excuses to learn are, I don't have a pencil right now, or uh, I don't have Photoshop, which is always the case. Like they're like, oh, I can't practice because I don't have Photoshop. Like, well, you have eyes, you can observe, right? So I, I always encourage people to be very observing of their surroundings. That's how you learn. Uh, you don't need to. You don't need to have a perfect memory, but you can start understanding. Like you don't have to practice uh, for three hours every day if you're not gonna understand what's going on. Uh, for anatomy and lighting and color, it's not just about uh, copying what you're seeing, but understanding what you're looking at. And when it comes to uh, lighting, for example, I I like to understand what's going on. Why is this? shadow being cast and why is this uh lighting this light bouncing onto the this object and how these objects interact you need to understand that it, it's not just about copying and practicing but about being uh trying to understand the logic behind it that's how it works like uh, it, it's hard for me to memorize things that don't make sense. Like I have to give it a logical explanation. Otherwise, it, it's very difficult for me to remember. And so, yeah, I, I, that's what I do. I just, I just learn from everything all the time. And sometimes I would, uh, I would like to apply all that knowledge that I got from just being outside on, in my own painting. So I come back to, to Photoshop. And I start sketching what I saw that day. You know, like, oh, I remember that lighting was super interesting and the colors, how they hit her face and blah, blah, blah. So I, I started enjoying it a lot more than just sitting and doing. I was actually uh, creating, you know, it was, yeah, from memory. But I, I don't know, like learning from the real world will teach you the real things than if you just try to do it like very educational. I, re I really like how you uh, how you explain that. And, and I've been talking to people about the idea of this balance that it's sort of like there's fun on one side and there's skill on the other. And when you're not having fun, mm -hmm. it's probably because your maybe your skills aren't high enough. So you have to do a little bit more skills. But if you're just doing skills all the time, that's not going to be fun either. And you have to go back to the things that you want to do. Um, so I guess I know this podcast is going a little bit long, but I'm really fascinated about what you just said. And I'm curious because I was thinking about a study routine for myself. And what I was thinking is a three-week routine. So one week is uh, focus on figures. The next week is focus on perspective. And the week after that is focus on shading. And you just do this three-week rotation. But now after hearing you talk, that just sounds ridiculous. And so I'm curious how how you, when if you were to go back, if you would, if if something like this would sound more realistic, it's like, okay, what you want to do is you want to have fun and experience life. So uh, first thing to do, go and get a coffee and book out an hour of time so you can just sit and enjoy your coffee and maybe bring some music so you have something good to listen to and bring your sketchbook and just sketch whatever looks interesting. If it's people at the coffee shop, if it's ideas in your head, it doesn't matter. Just sketch something. Then come back uh, I don't have a scanner, so take a picture of some of the sketches that you find interesting from that day and bring them into the computer and just start playing around with paint and see what you can come up with. And then when you're done that, self-evaluate and see where you might want to learn a little bit so that the next time you do this exercise, you can incorporate some of the things that you're learning. So maybe like I was trying to paint yesterday and I just found, oh, I don't, I just didn't know which colors to use for this face that I was trying to paint. So maybe that would be a case where, well, study a little bit about how oil painters choose their painting and see how you can apply that to the next digital painting you do. And really it's about 
maybe 10 minutes of study of, of how oil painters select colors and then go back to having fun and just enjoy the process. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think that uh, you don't have to be very strict about it. Like as long as you are having fun, uh, what I do is just I learn as I make. So if I want to achieve a certain look, I don't just do a study. I do it directly on my painting. And that's what I, I've, I've always told people. Like, you don't have to paint anything that you don't like or you don't enjoy. Like, if you see a painting by, I don't know, Da Vinci, you really like the, the texture on the, the skin or you like the anatomy. Uh, you don't have to copy his paintings you can just try to understand how he did it and do it directly on your your work you know you, you don't have to work a double you don't have to do a first study and then my painting and blah 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 because that's what most people do they think they have to develop a skill before they start doing their own stuff but why don't you just do the two things at the same time you know you're killing two birds with a stone and you don't have to to do uh to learn the skill uh, be perfect, be, yeah, be really good at it and then do it, you know, cause you know, you, you wouldn't, you will never be doing what you like. You will always be being a technician and not an artist. So you can learn a lot just from, for doing everything directly in your, your work, you know, like the coffee shop thing. You can be very, very inspired at that moment. It, sometimes you don't want that ex inspiration to leave you because sometimes you, it's when you're lying in bed at night and you have really great ideas for painting and then you wake up and they're all gone. Uh, when you're at the coffee shop, you can like get your imagination going, your creativity going. And when you have like that uh, fun uh, routine, because it's not very strict, but it's, act it's actually fun, you know, because you're doing it all the time what you like. And you can just get the, the, the creativity going in the, the coffee shop and then bring it back to your house. You know, that's the fun of uh, doing what you want all the time. I like it. And thank you very much. I, I feel... Uh really inspired after talking with you and, and hearing your journey. Uh, so thank you, Renee, for uh, sharing that with us. Do you have any last words um, before we wrap up here? I know we've gone a little bit long, but uh, especially that last question I think is really important uh, because I want people to have more fun. And I feel like for myself, when I was going through things, there was a lot of doing it, quote unquote, maybe not the wrong way, but I, what you just said about being a technician, I really felt like I was a technician. I was great at doing the software. I was great at somebody gives me a photo and like, hey, make this in 3D or gives me a concept art. Hey, make this in 3D, animate it like this thing. Okay, that's fine. But I, I never really felt like a true artist. And now that I'm starting to explore that path, I think this conversation was really helpful for me to understand uh, how you looked at the world, but also the, the, the way that you explained it really made sense to me. And I know that you know everybody has different opinions and ways that they can relate the world. But for me personally, it was very helpful. So um, any last words that you have uh, before we wrap up? I don't know. I just, I, I think, well, people always have very uh, questions about style, like how you develop a style. And all I want to say to people who have this question is that just do whatever you like. Like, your style will show no matter what. Like, if you draw a cat or a person or a house or a tree, like, you will be there. If you are true to yourself, your own self will show in your art. So just do what you want and be happy and have fun doing it. I love it. Thank you so much, Renee. I really appreciate it. Um, why don't you throw the best place? I know you're all over the internet, but where's the best place for people to connect with you? And then we'll have links and, and everything else that we'll put on on the page that we put up with this podcast. Uh, but what's the best place for people to find you online? Well, I have my web page, which is renegio.com, but uh, the social networks that I use most, where I post most of my art, is uh, Facebook and and Instagram. So you can find me on Facebook just as Renee Chio. It's very easy to find me. Like there, there aren't any other artist named Renee Chio. And Instagram, which is uh, Alice Juice, uh, it's spelled E double L I N Juice, you know. And those are the sites that I use most to post in art. 
Perfect. And we'll have links for all of that stuff. I know on your homepage, you've got links, I think, to pretty much everything else. Mm -hmm. And I just want to spell it out. So that's R-E-N-E-E-C-H-I-O.com, right? Yes. All right. And we'll have this episode as well as everything else that we've all the other interviews we've done at pencilkings.com slash podcast. And lastly, I just want to give a shout out for what the some of the cool things that we're doing in the community because I don't do this enough. And if you're out there listening and you're stuck on your own and you want to talk with people like me or we don't have Renee in the community yet, but we've got a lot of artists inside there who are all working on their own styles and developing their art and we've got a big course library that you can take advantage of um check us out at pencilkings.com so thank you so much renee i really appreciate it this was a long one but it was a really great one especially to me personally so i really appreciate it and um happy wednesday everybody I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.